Hello, uh, my name is Charles uh, from the Chester Community Law Project and this video is going to be based around uh, registering, registering a private limited company uh, and how you do it using the INO1 form. An INO1 form is essentially the application to register as a private limited company. It's a nine part form with five main parts and it's further broken down into sections A right the way through to O. Uh, there is a set fee to register by either post or by uh, online. Uh, the price does change year on year uh, and the information on the current price can be found in the first link below. Okay, so part one is all about company details. Uh, it's really easy, I'll walk you through it step by step now. So, as with any government form, it's essential that you fill it out in block capitals for ease of processing. Uh, part A1, uh, the first part of the form, is your company name, your proposed company name. Your company name does have to comply with government regulations and it must be available. It cannot be the same as another limited company's name. Uh, you can check whether a name is available uh, by following the link uh, in a1 uh, and uh, in the second link below in the comments. Uh, A2 um, applies if you want to include a sensitive or restricted term into your name. Uh, if this is the case just tick the box uh, and then the application will go through uh, and a decision will be made as to whether or not this is uh, permitted. A3 again not usual but if you want to apply to not have the limited um, or LTD statement at the end of your name, you'd select here to apply. Uh, this is only usually accepted in very specific circumstances, uh, like uh, if you're a charity uh, or something along those lines. Next is A4. Uh, so this is a selection of your proposed company type. Uh, for the instance of this video, we are discussing private limited companies by shares, uh, which is where shareholders' liability to creditors is limited by their original capital investment. A5 is the standard industrial classification code. Every type of business has its own individual code. Uh, where your business operates more than one uh, type of thing, uh, so you could be in transport uh, and production of a product, uh, you'd include more than one code. Uh, so the, in link three below, uh, that will take you to a, a website, a place uh, where you can establish what type of business you are and what your code is. Uh, A6 is super easy. Uh, it's where your registered office is, whether that be England, Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. So A7 follows on quite nicely from A6. It's simply the address where your company will be registered. It is vital that the address is consistent with A6. So if you've selected a uh, Northern Ireland in A6, it is essential that the address in A7 is a Northern Ireland address. A8 uh, is Articles of Association. So these act as a contract between the company and its shareholders setting out in its terms all the rights and obligations of both directors and shareholders. Model articles are available uh, set out by the government in link 4. Uh, if you did choose or want to include other articles or take articles out from the set out guidance, uh, you should seek professional advice. Uh, A8 is simply whether you have restricted articles included. So that's if you do decide to change, uh, you would select there. So more details on that can be found in link five. So now you've completed part one of the INO1 form, it is time to move on to part two. And this part concerns proposed officers of the company. So it's important to consider that not all parts of part two need to be filled out. Uh, as a private limited company, it is not mandatory 
to have an individual or a corporate secretary. However, if you do choose to have an individual secretary, uh, you will fill out their, that person's details in B1 and B2. If you do not want to put an individual secretary, you can leave this section blank. So, uh, section C1 through to C4 does not need to be completed if you have already completed B1 and B2. However, um, it can be completed. Again, it isn't mandatory to have a secretary as a private limited company. Although, if you do want one and you want to outsource that to another corporate body, you would include their details here. Following on then is D1 and D2. This is the director's appointments. Every limited company must have at least one director. Uh, public limited companies will need two, but for the purposes of this video, um, we are talking about private limited companies and therefore you must have at least one director. Uh, the director's details, uh, title, full name, uh, country of residence, nationality, uh, date of birth and their business occupation if they have one must be included in d1 d2 is the director's service address so this doesn't have to be their usual residential address uh, it can be the place of uh, office uh, of for the company uh, but there does need to be an address there which will be posted onto uh, company's house Continuing straight on then, D3 and D4 concern the same director that we've been dis discussing for D1 and D2. D3 is that, that individual's full date of birth. Now, this will not be, will not appear on company's house unless you have explicitly agreed uh, for it to do so. D4 is that same director's usual residential address. Now, this is where they usually reside, although this can be the same as the company's usual office, although you cannot uh, avoid uh, writing it out twice if you've already avoided writing out the address in D2, uh, as uh, instructed earlier. Section 243 exemption uh, is an exemption by the registrar from disclosing your usual residential address to the credit reference agencies under section 243 of the Companies Act 2006. Now, if this particular section applies to you, you will know about it and you will just select that box there. It is likely that this section will not apply to you. Uh, E1 to E4 is dedicated to if you want to appoint a corporate director. Uh, if you don't want a corporate director, it's absolutely fine. Uh, you just ignore this page and go on to the next. Uh, if you do want a corporate director, just ask the corporate director you intend to use to fill this section out for you. Part three is about statement of capital. Now, in this section, it's not uncommon uh, for mistakes to be made so it is important uh, that you do keep a mindful eye to ensure that everything is correct uh, so that the form doesn't come back and you do not have to do it again. This F1 section uh, is for the types uh, and currency of your shares so if you look at the main document there each row uh, will represent a different currency of share uh, now, in each row uh, of the same currency, you can, ha can have different types of share. So you can have ordinary shares, preferential shares, so on and so forth. Uh, for this example that you can see at the bottom uh, underneath the, the words there, uh, I have used sterling and ordinary shares because that's the most likely type of shares you'll be using. Um, the uh, following number, number 100, that's the amount of shares that your business is going to be split up into. And the, the price afterwards, £100, uh, that, it, that represents the amount per single share times by the amount of shares. So 100 shares at £1 per share uh, amounts to £100. Uh, the same goes for if it was £2 per share, 100 shares would be £200. Uh, if you are using uh, another type of share, say preferential shares, uh, on the, the next row down, uh, still in sterling, uh, you state how many uh, preferential shares are being split up as well. Uh, plus their quantity and total it all at the bottom. Uh, now, 
like I say, for this example, because it's the most likely type you'll be using, uh, ordinary, um, I have included a link, link six at the bottom, uh, with more details on to, uh, as to what different types of shares are and what it means to your business. Uh, F2 uh, is a section which uh, concerns the associated rights to each type of share that you have. Uh, as my example in the last uh, slide, uh, concerned ordinary shares you wouldn't actually need to uh, detail anything uh, in too much depth here uh, just put a statement uh, indicating that each shareholder uh, maintains equal rights to vote receive dividends uh, the liabilities uh, and a distribution of assets when winding up um, what that will do is that will adopt uh, the model articles um, set out by the companies act 2006 uh, and you won't need to do anything else there uh, now, if you did want to use a different type of share, you would use this section to uh, clarify, uh, identify the rights that you're associating to uh, voting, dividends, winding up and liabilities uh, for each type of share. Each type of share needs to be done on another page. So if you are using multiple types of share, you will have to do this multiple times. So this is a very important section. Uh, F3 is used to identify who the initial shareholders are and how much of the business they own. So it, the, the ownership of the business is determined by the amount of shares a person holds. If you're starting a business on your own and you have 100% of the shares, then you have 100% ownership of the business. Whereas out of 100 uh, shares, you had 51 shares, you would own 51% of the business, you would be the majority shareholder uh, and you would have uh, control over the business. It is important here, uh, if you're the main person starting the business, not to give away too many of your shares because you will lose control over your business. Uh, each shareholder here needs to have their, uh, in, a, in an individual row, uh, their name, their address, uh, the type of share that they hold, the quantity, the currency, and the price of each individual share. So in the, the last uh, section, F1, um, we, we had 100 shares, and we had the total value of those shares as 100 pounds. Uh, in this instance, if you had 100 of the shares, you just put one pound, because it's the value of each one of those 100 shares. Part four, statement of guarantee. Uh, because this video is tailored towards privately limited companies that buy shares, uh, you actually don't need to fill part four out, so you can move straight on to part five. Straight on then to part five, statement of compliance. In this part, the individuals who are subscribing to the company will sign evidencing that they have complied with the regulations set out in the Companies Act 2006. Here you will identify individuals with significant control over the company uh, and in being so are required to be registered on the public record. Uh, to be a person of significant control uh, you must meet one of three requirements. Either uh, have 25% shares or more uh, have 25% of the voting rights or hold the capability to appoint or remove the majority of the board of directors. Uh, if a person does meet one of these three requirements, then they are a person of significant control and must be registered in this section of the INO1 form. Uh, so for the first individual with significant control, uh, you'll put details in here, J1 and J2. So that's just going to be the name, uh, the country of uh, residence, their nationality. Uh, this is an important part. So it's the month and the year of birth uh, and then the service address. So the reason this is important is that the information on this page is what's going to be published onto the public record. Uh, so we don't give the day of birth. Uh, but it does ask for that individual's full date of birth uh, on the next page. Uh, nor do we, unless we have that individual's permission, uh, provide their residential address uh, because it is going to go onto the public record. So generally you will use the service address as the office uh, or the place of work um, and that will be posted uh, on the public re record. So this part concerns the same individual as you were filling out for in the previous page. 
uh, it's just a bit more details which are not going to be uh, posted onto the public record uh, it's super easy uh, now section 790 xf applies to an individual uh, where they have an exemption from disclosing their personal details to a credit reference agency uh, in line with the Companies Act 2006. Now, an individual will know whether that exemption applies to them. So if it's yourself, you will know. Uh, if you're filling the form out for another person with significant control, uh, make sure you ask them uh, so you can be absolutely certain you are doing it correctly. Again, uh, concerning the same individual or company as we've been filling out for the last two pages, uh, this page identifies how that company or individual has significant control over this company. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that person or individual will have had to have met one of three requirements. Um, and then you're simply just going to select how uh, that person has control uh, in this section. Just following on from the last page, uh, this is an extra section uh, of the last for where it is a trust, not an individual or a company uh, that has significant control over the company. So if you have a trust that has significant control, uh, you'll select on this page with their details uh, in the prior two. This part of the INO1 form uh, can seem a little daunting uh, although if you are setting up a private limited company for the first time on your own, it will likely not apply to you. Uh, so this concerns relevant legal entities. A relevant legal entity is uh, when the company is not going to be owned by an individual and is in fact owned by a legal entity. Now, the legal entity will be seen as having significant control if had it been an individual uh, that individual would have been a person of significant control or if that legal entity keeps its own pu uh, persons of significant control register or if that legal entity is subject to the financial conduct authorities disclosure and transparency rules or if that legal entity has voting shares admitted to trading on a regulated market in the uk now as i said uh, if you are setting up a, a private limited company for the first time, it's unlikely uh, that a, a, a legal entity, a relevant legal entity, uh, will be involved in the ownership of that company. So as with I-5 through to I-7, uh, relating to how an individual has significant control over a company, uh, J-3 to J-5, uh, is just how the relevant legal entity has control over the company that this INO1 form is in relation to. Now, K1 through to K6 uh, are for people, other registrable people. Now, another registrable person uh, could be a, corporate, a corporation sole, a government or government department of a country or territory as part of a country or territory, uh, an international organ organisation whose members include two or more countries, uh, or a local authority or local government body in the UK or elsewhere. So if another person is involved in the company that fits under these guidelines, uh, then you will put their details in here. Part six uh, is the election of keeping information on the public register. Uh, as a private company, you are able to select certain things uh, to keep on the public register as opposed to having to keep the registers yourself in your workplace, uh, which can be easier for you. Uh, as you'll see on the next pages, uh, you simply select the boxes of the things that you want to keep on the public register, uh, and that's going to make your life easier. A little bit simpler as you can see uh, it's just boxes to select so it's if your secretary uh, agrees to have their information put on the public register uh, the directors the members uh, and any persons of significant control uh, what is important in this uh, this section is that those individuals who the information is about uh, must give their consent uh, for that information to be published we are now coming on to the end of the form. 
Uh, part seven, eight, and nine are all encompassed in this next page. So moving swiftly on, uh, part seven uh, is a uh, confirmation that all the subscribers uh, to uh, this company uh, that have been named are aware and uh, give their consent. Uh, part eight uh, is that those individuals with significant control are aware that they are a part of this application. And part nine, which does run onto the next page as well, uh, is to establish whether or not uh, it was the subscribers to this company themselves uh, who have completed this form or uh, it's been outsourced to another agency uh, and they've completed it on behalf of the subscribers to this company. Uh, this is the final page of the IN01 form. So congratulations uh, for getting this far. Uh, it is a complicated form uh, and it is important to do it correctly. Uh, this part of the form is just the presenter's information. So the individual who has been filling out the form uh, will fill this in. Uh, and there is also a checklist to ensure that you've done everything correct. Uh, just a double check. Thank you very much for watching. That draws an end to another video by the Chester Community Law Project in partnership with the Cheshire and Warrington Business Growth Programme. Uh, I've included lots of links below uh, with information on the INO1 form and how to fill it out. Uh, so if you are stuck at all, that's the first place you should go. Uh, also, we do have a lot more videos online available to you through the Cheshire and Warrington Business Growth Programme. So definitely check those out because they're all designed to help you grow.